it. Good evening, everybody. We're going to be starting this duo today with two teams, two teams that, uh, two different uh, duos that are very different and yet have certain similarities. First of all, we have Frédéric Borel. Frédéric Borel began to work in the 1980s, and I'll come back to that later. And the second team will be the architects from Ljubljana in Slovenia. This is the OFIS uh, agency made up of Rock Oman and Spila Vidicnik. What fascinated me when I was looking at your works was uh, this proximity, the fact that you are both very near and yet very far from each other, in the way in which you have actually taken a stand, you've taken possession of a certain space, you have two different uh, proposals that dialogue perfectly well with each other. There are similarities between what you do because in both cases, although there are flagrant differences, we're dealing here with an architecture that has no complexes. It looks as if it's completely uh, without complexes, no guilt anywhere. When no longer talking about Protestant modernity. On the contrary, it's a very uh, radical opening. Um, the project, like the stadium in Ukraine that you did, these are things that are fun, gay, fun, be it that football stadium or even your mock-up here in the room next door, it's fun. You are designing something so that people can play with those cubes, so that they themselves can build something, a bit like Rubik's Cube. They themselves can uh, decide what architecture they want to build. And that fun aspect is something that we also see in Frédéric Borel's work. In his work, what is interesting is that it never looks very serious. In France, in Europe, in cinema, in architecture, everybody seems to be too serious. But you are not. There, it looks to us as if you are reaffirming that fun is all right something that can be happy, gay. Architecture doesn't have to be morose. You might tell me later that this is not the case, but we also get the feeling that all three of you are having fun when you do your designs. I'm very familiar with Frédéric Borel's work, and when you look at it, it almost looks like a child's drawing in the uh, models, in the mock-ups, there is this fun side to it. It looks a bit like a toy, the pleasure of creating. So for both of you, in both of your works, we do get this overriding impression of the pleasure of designing something. I'm going to come back to the uh, official text that I had uh, decided to, to write and then I will ask you questions. It's true that you both appeared in critical architectural periods. Frederick, you appeared in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, government policies were beginning to encourage young architects. The, what we called the, uh, the end of modernity, uh, of the modern era, the end of, uh, you, this was a post-modern uh, era that you were moving into, and you might explain this to us, but you were also helped quite considerably by certain structures that were set up. Uh, Michel Lombardini began to trust young architects and to call upon young architects. You began uh, designing very soon after you graduated. 
but you had actually, uh, and you uh, from in Slovenia, you had actually designed before you even graduated, before you got your diploma. In Slovenia, it wasn't an architectural crisis. It was a much bigger crisis than that. Uh, you uh, emerged from the former Yugoslavian uh, bloc, and you were trying to find your place in Europe to maybe um, integrate Europe. And in Slovenia, there were certain policies that were set up that allowed younger generations to suddenly have access to public competitions, and young architects were able to pass these uh, competitions competitive competitions without necessarily having references to do so. So that's one of the similarities that you have between uh, both of you, the two groups. I also think that there are two different types of traditions here. Uh, Frédéric, you are more on the plastic side of architecture. What you do is uh, uh, similar to Le Corbusier, in the last periods, uh, there's a, a very plastic aspect to architecture, but there is another tradition as well, and that is return to the urban living, return to cities, the, re the return of uh, the Aldo Rossi school of thought on micro spaces, on uh, micro um, squares, and you as well. Uh, from office, you have a mixture between two, two traditions as well. You've got uh, the uh, tradition of the former great Slovenian architect that after the First World War came back to Ljubljana, his uh, native town, before having built things around the sh uh, castle in Prague, the church uh, whose name I have forgotten, he then came back to Ljubljana and he uh, began working, it was a bit like acupuncture, with tiny, with little projects that completely modified the town, beautified the town, which at that time uh, became the capital of an independent country, which had always been attached to the Austrian Empire, and <coughs> that was the uh, founding uh, architect. It was Yugoslav. Before it was the Austrian Empire, before it was uh, Yugoslavian. <laughs> but thank you for having pulled me up on that. <coughs> you knew, therefore, to work with different types of architecture. Your architecture is extremely attentive to details to the shape, to form, to micro spaces, and also the efficiency of the post-war architecture, where there were a lot of uh, very uh, rational buildings, high quality buildings that were built. As Dominique said in his article in DA, within Yugoslavia, your country actually managed to keep your own culture. And you knew to mix these two different types of architecture that we would have thought would be irreconcilable. You were attached, uh, uh, as Pleshnik was, to uh, materials such as wood. And you also do a work of uh, streamlining the building of uh, buildings that are extremely functional. After the war in Slovenia and before the 1990s, when Slovenia actually uh, switched, well, changed. That was the second similarity between the two of you. The third similarity between the two of you is that even if you have done football stadiums and museums, and you, Frédéric, you have done an architectural school, and you've also designed other beautiful projects, you have always been extremely attached to housing. Frédéric, you've always done uh, low-cost housing, and you've done a lot of these housing projects as well in Slovenia. And some of them are quite similar because Frédéric 
your plans, are your designs, e even if the projects themselves are very fragmented, they're fractured, but they are always extremely logical. And you, the two of you, you have designs that uh, uh, for you, you have to build at a very low cost. And the ratio between total surface and useful surface is completely factored into your architectural designs. So that's another similarity between the two of you. And then later, we will talk a little bit more about your differences. It's true, Frédéric, as you were showing us in your exhibition, you have, first of all, you have a central block for housing, and then you build onto that block. You're not that much, that so much interested in the inside of the, the building, and we could discuss that later. Maybe that is a French idiosyncrasy. People are always reproaching the French for this, because our architecture is always a type uh, of block architecture. You do start off with a block, and then you uh, coat it, you dress it. And it's not so much the inside spaces that you're interested in, it's to offer the public additional space. All of your projects are uh, really focused on that. It is offering a public space to people, which is an addition to what already exists in the cities. It uh, embellishes the, the squares, the streets. And you, in Slovenia, what I find fascinating with you is that it, it's a little bit the same thing. You also have blocks that you start with. The wonderful building that you built in Paris, for example, it's just a concrete bar, basically, and then all of a sudden, you understand uh, it, it comes alive because you have dressed it with something. You've, you've dressed it in your way, and it qualifies the interior space. So on uh, Frédéric Borel's side, there is a rupture. On your side, there's continuity. Now, I think that the discussion we're going to have uh, tonight between us all is one that should be based on the following question. Is architecture something that you see from the outside and then you move onto the inside, or is it the other way around? Do you start from the inside and then move outside? I think uh, I'll uh, try to give you enough time to talk amongst yourselves. So I'll start with Frédéric. I'll ask you a question, Frédéric, first of all. Can I ask you as to how, how did you start off in this business? Well, thank you and good, good evening to everybody. I'm sorry I'm going to be speaking in French because I'm much more fluent in French than I am in English. In the beginning for me, I think that in France there has been a cultural interest for many decades in architecture and there have been many opportunities for young architects. That was lucky for us and often the, the, um, the main way to get into architecture was through social housing. And as with many of my colleagues, I took advantage of the administrative possibilities that existed in France and that are perhaps unique to France. Also in France, the French, the citizens, French citizens, are very interested in architecture. Culturally speaking, it is part of our tradition, and they are very open as to different types of architecture, different types of progress, and one form of progress is via architecture. So they are very open to new things. And I was lucky to be able to ride on that wave and to come up with my first projects. How did you start off, though? What uh, studies did you do, for example? Well, like most young architects, I began working in an agency, and then I did competitions. And then I also um, I worked with Christian de Port Saint Parc, and I was able afterwards to use that uh, uh, as a springboard to work for myself. 
thanks to certain project managers such as Michel Lombardini, Daniel Valabreg, uh, and the construction plan, there were people who were stepping stones for me. They were well-known people, and I think that I have to pay tribute to them today because they really did promote architect, particularly for young uh, architects. And then afterwards, I don't know, what do you want me to say more? I'll ask a question of the other team. Excuse me. So, be extremely factual, <laughs> extremely factual, and tell me, first of all, how did you meet? How did you meet? How did all of this start? Why did you suddenly want to do competitions? Explain all of that to us, please. Dilo, are you hearing me? Okay. Uh, I'm very sorry that I will speak in English. <laughs> we, s we started to learn French with Spella together uh, two years ago. I gave up last year, so she's still. <laughs> yeah, I, okay. Yeah. I can order uh, like, you know, tart of chocolate or something, but uh, yeah, I could not go into very intellectual discourses. So maybe I would also try to speak more as a kind of from more interesting point of view like how did we meet yeah so we met it second no second year or an architecture uh, year in school of architecture in Ljubljana and suddenly we started to do every project together in school even some <coughs> subject which I was not present at the school, so some professor never met me. So uh, I even we wanted to be a part even when we started to have a postgraduate in uh, AA in London. We started to change the group, but already in second semester we, <laughs> we, we saw that this is not working. So basically I, I, I could not even explain, but um, we never had some sort of, I would say, deep correlation of, let's say, um, interchangeability or something, but um, I think we each one has something which somebody uh, uh, like the one has not. So I think we have this kind of de functionality into one separate person. So I could say for myself that, that I could not really function as an architect all by myself, you know. I could not be Jean Noël, in, you know, a big person. Uh, so maybe we can still uh, keep some sort of each individuality, not to change somebody else or to change you. So that's a kind of a bit of historic background, if I helped you a bit to illustrate <laughs> how did we start. Très yeah. bien. Uh, talk about uh, conditions we started. Uh, it's true that uh, at that time uh, we, we basically started a little bit later, uh, year 96, 97. It was year when we uh, were just at the last uh, years of university and there were many competitions being held uh, in Slovenia to do new buildings, new infrastructures, like uh, Slovenia was a new country. We didn't have uh, like a building of parliament, opera house, museum, like all these things had to be uh, constructed. And uh, we were lucky that we could uh, enter all these competitions without any restrictions, like we didn't need to submit portfolios or uh, show that we have some bank guarantees behind or things like, like uh, it, today it's maybe more difficult. But at that time, uh, it was just fresh time and uh, we basically entered all the competitions and in year 97, 98 we won three major competitions. One was football stadium, one was uh, city museum and one was uh, one large uh, housing and this is basically how we started our office. So we never had experience to work in someone else's office, we just uh, started. <laughs> um, so. Um, 
Yeah, that's basically how, how the situation was uh, before. And later, yes, uh, we entered many competitions to do uh, housing, uh, uh, social housing or lo low-cost housing. Uh, there was a lot of housing being built in Slovenia at that time. It's not that we are only interested in housing, but uh, yes, housing is also one program that uh, for us is uh, essential. Um, and we were lucky to actually build a few of those uh, buildings, uh, but otherwise, the more diverse is the program, the more the more challenge it means to us, and we like to do every type of buildings that comes across. Uh, Frédéric, Borel, uh, Frédéric Borel was saying earlier that in France, when he started, there uh, was a lot of attention that was being paid to architecture. People were very interested in architecture when he started out. Was there the same phenomenon in Slovenia back in the 1990s, uh, the end of the 1990s when you started out? Were people really interested in architecture outside the architectural schools themselves? No, actually not. Uh, actually, uh, for us, uh, it was a different approach. Like uh, all the competitions we won, uh, it was not because of uh, architectural expression or some aesthetics that maybe clients would like. It was more for functional reasons and uh, reasons uh, uh, the, our projects were like uh, the high, they had the high value in terms of being um, selected by the clients, especially in uh, multiple housing sector. It was uh, very difficult, still is today, to find a client who would appreciate uh, good architecture or interesting architecture, especially research. Um, uh, they would even be more scared of uh, research, meaning that maybe it's extra cost or maybe it could cause some complications they don't really want. Uh, so basically, uh, mostly the competitions we won, we won them because we knew how to show a good, re like how to make a, a good floor plan that functions, how to create uh, good factors between selling surface or usable surface or building surface, etc. And architecture was something that we pushed inside from the <laughs> from the corner. Um, Basically, in uh, in the countries of Eastern Europe, uh, it's the same in Belarus, where we did the stadium, or in Russia, where we also uh, did few projects. We never built one, but we developed sim a few projects. Is that uh, people who run uh, money, the investors, uh, they normally don't come from very uh, intellectual or cultural background, uh, and basically they would like to build. They they take uh, architecture as a kind of investment that can. Uh, you know, bring uh, money, and uh, basically these are unfortunately clients we are dealing with. So basically, all the research, architectural research we we bring, we bring it from the site. You said something that is very interesting when you said that you were able to build not only in Slovenia but also outside of Slovenia, in Belarus, in Russia, in France. Later on, we'll come back to the fact that you're building outside of Slovenia because you, Frédéric, have you built anything outside of France? No, no, I haven't. You've won a lot of competitions in Austria and Vienna, but you haven't actually built anything outside of France. So we'll come back over that later. However, I would like to move on to the second point, and uh, this is the combination, the mixture that you have been able to create between uh, craftsmanship, going back to some basic materials, and yet having a very good uh, rational architecture. And you, Frédéric, you've worked a lot on the architectural form and on public spaces. Can you explain this, again, in a very pragmatic way? Could you give me two examples of a project such as uh, Oberkampf and uh, something else, and tell us exactly how you did this. These are questions that I often get asked in every time I start designing a project. But it's true that uh, before I do any design, I ask myself the fundamental questions. What are we going to build? What is the context? What will it bring to the citizens, to the people who walk by, 
quite apart from what is it going to offer to the people who live in it. So that's the first thing that we have to decide upon. We have to design places that people can actually live in. And it is a fundamental message for me in all of my projects. It's, I think, the most important reason that underpins all of my designs. It's the reason why I'm interested in architecture. My architecture has to welcome people in. <coughs> Here, the model that I have designed for the city of architecture, it is something that you often see in my work. It has to be on a scale of um, public housing, but it also has to be on the scale of public spaces. In Belleville and Oberkampf, it's a good example of a new space that is being offered in Paris. For me, a place has to be as something that merges, for those who live in it, it has to merge in with, the, with its context, with its outside colors. Even if it's on one of the big boulevards in Paris, in Belleville, the, um, the streets are extremely colorful. And I want that to be seen in my building as well. We have to live in a type of osmosis with the surrounding district. There's also this idea of a, a, a journey undertaken together, of sharing together uh, different types of uh, housing projects. But it is a journey. It's like doing a film. We have to see it all as a whole, the design, the actual model, and then the real building. And sometimes when you have a constraint, such as something that is only 20 meters wide and 120 meters long, and there, there, there are no exits uh, at all, we have to build, we have to find something that can be rich. In Oberkampf, it was a, a, a district made up of a lot of small shops and craftsmen's shops. And the only positive thing that I could really give them was to offer them a garden, because there was no garden in their district. And I wanted my garden to be open to all so that everybody could look on it with pleasure, uh, the garden of the building, people could, uh, the people who lived in the building could enjoy it, but also the passers-by could enjoy it. So in all of my architectural projects, that is the first question that I ask myself. What is my building going to offer to a town or to a district? That underpins everything we do. Right, maybe we can move back uh, to Rock. How did you reconcile tradition with what you do? Uh, I was listening to you at your conference uh, in Frédéric Borel's architectural school two months ago, and you quoted Pechnik, you uh, referred a lot to Pechnik. So I wanted to know, how do you actually reconcile these two traditions? You've got the first tradition of a very rational architecture and the type of craftsman-like uh, facet that you bring to what you do and to the material that you use. Can you tell us about some precise uh, projects that you have done? We don't have any pictures here, but they'll be able to see this afterwards. Can you tell us how you reconcile that? <coughs> I think we, we, it was very, very welcoming, maybe, uh, the time of globalization after uh, this booming, which was done uh, first in economic way, and after this crisis, um, I think it was also time that reconsider your ways, how you deal, let's say, what you do, that what happened after this globalization, maybe you start to ask about your identity. And us, Slovene, I don't know if you know it, there is two million of <coughs> Our uh, population. Uh, it's a huge question about the identity. So um, that's why maybe the name of Plechnik uh, is so much, even every time more, I would say, contemporary and to deal with and maybe to go back um, from where you come from, coming from. So his way of doing craftsmanship, like in all contemporary architecture, uh, he was like contemporary of Le Corbusier, all the rising of functionalistic uh, architecture. He 
really kept his own way of dealing with architecture. He created uh, his own language. He, we could say that he created some kind of identity through his own, let's say, inner view of looking at it and he never gave up and he never went into any other direction. So that's why uh, at this time we are also kind of considering, let's say, um, our identity through maybe regional architecture. So we came back into Alpine world and to look all, I would say, into this um, I could say that it's very um, not known architecture. It's like uh, architecture without architects. It's a kind of regional, you could call it vernacular or whatever. And we are trying to, let's say, keep up this language alive again. Because in our country, it's a big fear of um, this anonymous architecture is tearing down. So the big enemies are their own owners of this architecture. So they are tearing this building down and raising some, let's say, generic, let's say, architecture which doesn't have any deal to, to do with it. So maybe in some our latest project, what we did is to just convert the existing barn we completely kept it from outside and we did a new, let's say, inner part. So that's it's something which we are lately in all this kind of questioning of identity, also economical crisis and political crisis that we can reach something which we can grab and go forward in our way. You talk a lot about identity. It's true that for us, as the French, it sounds a little strange, and I'll ask Frederic this question after as well. Do you ask yourself, do you make sure that you're doing Slovenian architecture when you design? Um, basically, we're trying not to ask ourselves this question. <laughs> because sometimes things like you are doing, maybe it's, I would say that, that you should be reinterpreted by, let's say, you. And I, I just have in mind the postcard from, I don't know, Le Corbusier. He didn't want to talk about language or architecture. He detests to, to, to speak about architecture. So I would not uh, be concerned of we are doing Slovene international um, Basically, you have to deal with, because now, today, there are no limits. There are no styles. There are no, let's say, something which, you know, everything was in historic, uh, I would say, in all the styles, architecture. You were kind of based or you were kind of limited by, um, or the rules were done, they were made, they were written. And today, basically, you don't have any limits. You have some economical, but basically, you don't have any things which uh, I would say, especially in this world of globalization, where you have all the materials on the market, you can get everything from, you have the same stores, you have the same brands all over where you get. So every time in every country you get, you are searching for some local uh, product that you can bring into your country to show where you have been. So I would say that these are the small things which maybe we can go uh, back to raise also this poli political question, whether to go for your, um, let's say, like you say, Slovenia architecture, whatever you would call it, whether you are small or big. And I would say that's a, about still it, each individual um, person which he will express like the best as he can. And maybe the other then will, they will say about the way the movement like, um, there were a lot of question uh, when we had some exhibition of several Slovene offices that uh, it was a kind of international boom that uh, young Slovene offices, they did some sort of production uh, like 
any other countries around. So they were questioned, how can these small countries produce these young offices? But that was nothing about any, they thought that Slovene as a country, they encourage this kind of production, but it is pure chance. So <clears throat> in this matter, I would say that, um, that there are not such a big questions today to raise, but maybe you can start with the fragments of architecture. It's not like in some past time when an architect could build the cities. It's today there are fragments that you can build in the hall. Yes, let, could you tell us a little bit about national identity as well? What's extremely interesting with you is that uh, you're wondering as to whether it is, uh, whether it's a national identity, but you are actually building internationally. You've built in uh, Belarus and France. Uh, Frédéric, have you ever asked this question? Have you ever wondered whether you are building something that has a national identity? What, what was your reference architecture? Because uh, Rock here is talking to us about vernacular architecture. How exactly do you feel about this, Frédéric? Let me tell you a little bit more about architecture the world over. It's a planetary thing. Today, with the tools that we have, with the materials that we have, today we can build anything in any context. We can produce architectural designs that are almost interchangeable throughout the entire world. And sometimes uh, that can be a little disarming as well. And I think that it is not a very good thing for architecture to be interchangeable the world over. Uh, in that way, architectural designs simply become consumer products, consumer goods. But not everything is always possible for everybody. I often work on average-sized uh, buildings in very strict economic conditions as well a lot of economic constraints. And when you're building housing, there is always, at the end of your design, there is somebody who's going to have to build it. That's a constraint, but that is part of our challenge. We design, but we have to build with others in given circumstances, in a given context. And when you're wondering about the cultural identity of architecture, it is inherently linked with the hand of the person who builds it. So maybe we're not producing the same things, but what is vital is to participate. The architect has to be a driving force for an entire team. He has to set the movement going. He knows what he wants to design. He knows what he wants to produce. But the architectural exercise can actually go further than what he envisaged. That's what's so interesting in the complex things that we can design. They can be complex. They can be singular. They can be an architectural identity. Any project, even if you have young Slovene architects who are building in France, they have to fit into French context as well. I think that what would be interesting would be to ask them how they built in France, how they designed in France. Architects have one of their challenges is to surpass uh, rules and constraints, but to do it in a very pragmatic way. Uh, Spila, can I ask you a question? When you work, do you work with the building companies who have a real building culture? Uh, for example, 
it's true that uh, when you're doing your cladding, for example, you have uh, wood in your country, you were, you're able to do these wooden panels for the facades of your social houses. Do you go to uh, small companies that can give you that, or do you go to uh, big uh, construction companies that are almost acultural? Uh, that really depends on the on the scale of the building. I mean, with small buildings, we try to work with local uh, local companies, small companies, but bigger scale. Normally, it goes through some kind of tender procedure through the client. Uh, so we wouldn't really have influence of uh, who's going to be selected. Uh, like even you are not supposed to have any influence at all about that. So it's 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 really about. Uh, the scale and of the building. But maybe if I add something to this uh, the, uh, question, um, it's not only vernacular uh, buildings in Alpine area that we uh, feel it's important to appreciate and maybe to uh, input in architecture or urban scale. Um, it's more maybe about European uh, or European identity, European traditions. Um, Lately, we uh, teach uh, in the States, and basically this question even became more interesting for us through teaching American students. Uh, like, for example, when you have American students teaching how to develop a city, it's kind of not easy because they don't have such rich traditions as we have you know, in Italy, in, in France, uh, even in Slovenia, in Germany, and so on and so on. Uh, basically, f uh, to teach them urbanism is uh, something extremely difficult. So basically, you come back, uh, appreciate learning, researching uh, European identities, and that's basically what, what we want to say. Um, Today, with this globalization, when a lot of international kind of big uh, companies, like even producers, are kind of really tar targeting also small nations like Slovenia, this is actually for us important uh, to, 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 to keep. So basically, this is what we feel needs to be appreciated, researched, and uh, developed further in contemporary language. Have you seen any big difference when you did your uh, Pantin, the building for the students? Did you see a difference between building in France and building in Slovenia? Because it's true that in France, we get the feeling that uh, there are certain architects there are a lot of uh, foreign architects who have built things, but not everybody has managed to build something in Paris. Now, you might say you've got Kengukuma, who does extraordinary buildings in Japan, and up until today has not been able to design a top quality building in France. But you, uh, your reality has been very different. Were you appreciated or criticized in the French system? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Um, for us, this was the, one of the most interesting uh, experiences. I think even now, uh, for instance, it's a, a bit dreamy even now that it's, hanging, it's heading behind me because I think we had such luck at that time. It was the first time when we were even invited or uh, introduced to deliver portfolio. Even then, when we compete to the other offices and then even to, to have this kind of opportunity to build, not, you know, like in France, but in Paris, which is like a state into the state, which, you know, we learn uh, later that it's even more uh, difficult to get a project. So basically, what, what, what was then uh, the next question about race, you know, like you mentioned, Kengo Kuma, you know, you have like riding on a big wave and then you're riding on a small uh, uh, waves. So this is kind of projects uh, which we were kind of uh, um, familiar with because it has a fixed site of two cubes the project which we de developed so many times in Slovenia. So the project with the fixed cubes, fixed width, height, 
and land. So basically, we felt familiar with this, that we, what we had to do to, we had, for instance, just 12 meters uh, in the width and 160 meters long to buildings and what we had to do that uh, for instance nine stories uh, high building it's almost a high-rise building so we tried to fix and to diminish the scale of the building and we had two different faces of the entrances and to facing on the street and and so on. And then you first things which you ask, uh, what is our experiences with, uh, let's say, to, co um, to compare the industry? And uh, I would, did I understand you right, that how was the building uh, experience here and Slovenia to compare? Or So that it's a point that we were kind of, um, let's say, um, really surprised in two ways. The first is very efficient um, getting building permission. I would say this was the one of the fastest project. Uh, the second was that we could uh, deal without local office. So this was the second very uh, positive. But the third thing is what was kind of experience in, um, let's say, interesting way was that uh, construction company, we expected that, um, that the quality of construction uh, craftsmanship will be of high level. But in this case, we could maybe uh, compare that some even Slovene uh, construction companies who could do the at least not better way than this huge construction company. I could say that was also uh, maybe in politics because we came from outside, they could feel that we are like younger offices without any, let's say, experiences. But all together, uh, I would say that it went quite uh, efficiently further on and um, what was the next question that we we thought that from now on it will go things quite faster but at that time we said we, we figure out that still it was a half dream because to I would say to, to have a continuation to have a project there uh, it would have to be much, much, I would say, difficult that we expected that it will be. Earlier, Frédéric was talking about the user of the building, the inhabitant of the building, and he said that for him, when he was doing social housing, low-cost housing, what he wanted to do primarily was to give the inhabitant of the building additional public space. He talked about uh, the type of antechamber that he did uh, in Belleville. It, there is a, a huge type of lobby, if you like, that uh, is the threshold between the actual street, the boulevard on the one hand, and the building on the other. Spiller, could I ask you something? When you design something, what do you want to give the inhabitant? What do you want to bring to the inhabitant? Is it, like Frédéric, a public space that you want to offer them, or is it something else? Um, like, we didn't have, uh, I mean, I would say, opportunity uh, very often to build something in ur like a big urban scales. Like, many of our social buildings are very determined in a sense that uh, you have a plot like similar to the one here in uh, in Paris, that you have a plot that has very, very strict determinations and that at the end, all you can do is a kind of cube. So basically, developing something more to give to inhabitants on that cube is for us uh, uh, an important task. Um, in social housing, also in France, as well as in Slovenia or in Germany or any, like now we are doing some social housing in, in Belgium, like right now, you have very, very determined rules how apartment can be organized. You cannot do large apartments because uh, you have to determine the economy. And then on the other hand, all rooms, sizes, number of rooms, size of bathrooms, etc., etc., is very much determined. 
by uh, by law, like the length of kitchen cabinets, the length of wardrobes, and so on and so on. So basically, uh, in social housing, there is not much research you can do inside the apartment. Like you are so very much determined if you want to basically uh, get approval and maybe win a competition or get approval to to build it. Um, so basically, what we found uh, in this housing is uh, a kind of uh, envelope um, between the apartment and the external space. So basically, um, in many of our social housing, we then uh, play or, or research or create something more for the inhabitants on this envelope where we can place balconies, terraces, uh, lojas, kind of additional space that uh, can go inside the cost of that very limited budget and that can offer these people something more. Um, Slovenians, um, we normally come from the countryside, like my grandmother, his grandmother, like uh, everyone has origins in the countryside. So basically external space, nature in the apartment, having a, a kind of garden, even if it's a small garden on the balcony, it's a very important element. So basically we wanted to, in many of social housing, give that uh, quality to the, uh, to the inhabitants. Um, Almost all uh, housing, uh, even the, the housing here in Paris, we needed to sign the contract uh, and we were limited to a certain budget. So basically all these extra qualities you give, you have to really uh, be very, very um, economical with, with it. Uh, and that's in a way our approach, so to give each apartment some extra quality. Microphone, please. There's, thank you. There, there is a type of movement that we can find in a lot of uh, French and Parisian uh, architectural agencies. You have, I don't know whether Francis Romblay has uh, taken you to visit some of uh, the design projects in Paris, but more and more what we're seeing today are additional spaces that are not actually in the housing project itself because as you said the inside of the housing is uh, super super controlled what you can put in there and it's true that uh, we have discussed all of this we've debated all of these new types of low-cost housing that is to appear in France where the actual main cell the cube doesn't move there are too many constraints but on the contrary everything that is around it changes <coughs> It's uh, almost like between two worlds, uh, between the internal space and, and the outside space that you've got all of the fundamental work of an architect that has to be done. Frédéric, could you tell us a little bit about this movement, this trend today? What do you think? Do you think that your facades are active facades or do you think that a facade should be something else? Oh, there's an awful lot I could say about facades. And there are a lot of different ways of dealing with facades. On the last project that I did, I was uh, wondering as to the depth of the facade. And my colleague, uh, our colleagues today have been telling us sort of all of the constraints that there are when you're designing anything. First of all, because of uh, the, the, the lenders, the, uh, um, the building companies, social constraints, but it is also a real challenge for architects. There, there is something to do there. There is something that you can invent there. When you have limited uh, uh, square meters to work in, I still think it's possible to invent things. Now, sometimes uh, I know that I work a lot uh, on balconies as well, because in a building, sometimes the balcony is the only little space of freedom that you can give the inhabitants. In Rouen recently, uh, I designed something, maybe it wasn't entirely successful, but what we tried to do was to design something that looked like a maze, a simple plaster wall no matter how banal it is, you can change it. You can pleat it. You can fold it. It's, uh, you can turn it into a, a type of ribbon, and it then will delineate your linen space. You can do with plaster, with a sheet of plaster, the same as what you can do with a sheet of paper. And 
you can build a protective envelope out of anything. And that envelope, to get from the inside to the outside of that envelope, is where our challenge is because there must not be a, a rupture, a break between moving from the inside to the outside. It must be a fluid movement. And in what we're doing in Rouen, we're going to be having these types of colored sheets that uh, we will be uh, building out of. It's true that the cell or the cube can uh, force you to reinterpret things, to innovate. But housing is also a way of writing a remarkable story. It's a remarkable story because when you're using these different cells, these different cubes, when you're adding them all together, you have to, in your mind, imagine the people who are going to live in them, the men, the women, the children. How are they going to interact? It calls upon your imaginary. That's why I often compare it to, to a filmmaker. An architect is actually putting his creation to music, to space, to movement. Now, you said that we were still a little bit like children, and uh, we tend to be using architecture as a fun thing, a game. Well, I like it when you say that, because for me, it is a fun thing. It is something whereby uh, we are uh, putting people on the stage of our architecture. I was very struck, actually, the, the models, what I wanted to finish with was that those models outside are nothing more than big toys. And whether these models are 3D or paper or just uh, a crumpled piece of paper, there's always a way of inventing something. And it's extremely, uh, there's an immense pleasure in creating something, touching something, being surprised by something that takes form in front of your eyes. As I was saying, I was struck when I saw your two installations, as I said earlier, because somewhere along the line, there is uh, a, a link between architecture and clothing. Uh, Frédéric, you have done a draped installation. Your mother was a seamstress. And uh, can you explain to us exactly how you actually clothed, you draped your installation, maybe thinking or remembering her? You have draped certain facades. You have used sheets of fabric or sheets of material or concrete as if they were sheets of fabric. And uh, you as well, you have extremely sensual relationships with bodies. You've got uh, prone bodies, standing bodies. In both cases, we get this feeling that there is a link between architecture and sewing and couture. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Does uh, couture and sewing actually inspire you? Does clothing inspire you? Do you see the link between clothing and architecture? <laughs> uh, maybe it's too much personal question, you know, I, I'm personally involved with uh, yeah, <laughs> a fashion designer, so <laughs> it's a kind of heavy and kind of uh <laughs> maybe too heavy question for maybe Spila can answer. <laughs> well, uh, Rook's, uh, Rook's wife is a <laughs> fashion designer, <laughs> so, um, and I wanted to be a fashion designer when I was, uh, <laughs> and then I went to study architecture because my family said that in fashion designer maybe I will not survive <laughs> economically, <laughs> so this is how we met. But uh, yes, I mean, of course, uh, each building has a certain envelope and sometimes uh, you have determinations that come either from inside of the building or for, uh, from kind of urban um, plans that are determined and then you have to create a certain envelope to the building that you can also call a dress or a, a gown. Um, uh, to, for us personally, it's interesting this kind of uh, 3D, uh, 3D effect that can maybe happen in this envelope. So it's not about a, a kind of thin fabric, but maybe more about kind of stretched fabric that creates uh, spaces between, uh, between, in between. Uh, so basically, it's not about the single surface that we would research, but actually what what is in between. So 
maybe that's my answer. But um, yes, I mean, many times, actually, some critics, uh, we, d we don't see that ourselves, but they talk about colors uh, in our architecture and maybe compare it to some kind of fashion uh, design. Um, everything has its uh, reason, and of course, fashion and um, clothing has certain aesthetic that we also look for. So basically, both <laughs> is aesthetic issue. To talk about my uh, exhibit, my installation, it, uh, mine is mostly a message. And the object that we produced with uh, Joseph, who helped me render something that was feasible, is a minimal message, but it is one that is in response to a given context. This is a form that exists, so that welcomes us uh, as architects. Uh, we were asked to give a message, and I chose this idea of a, a type of draped envelope. I think that what is important is not just the shape, the form of things, but envelopes can take many different forms. There are many different types of uh, highly performing materials today that you can use as the outside envelope for something. The envelope for me is something uh, for which there are no uh, rules at all. Uh, we have our envelope that we've done here. We could have done with a 3D model, but we finally did it with uh, a staff uh, uh, craftsman. And this movement of something that is draped is uh, a certain type of architecture, a certain form of architecture. We haven't done it to make sculptures, for example. What we have done it for is to just show that the architect can also use those types of drapery forms. We could do it with glass. We could do it with zinc. We could do it with anything. And often in the architectural designs that I have been able to offer, there is this concept of utter freedom of shape, of form. Nothing is forbidden. But there are certain questions that you have to ask yourself when you're in a given site. The architect must uh, wonder about identity. Uh, the, architecture, uh, the architect has to show the world in a different way to make sure that, the world's, that, that people see architecture in a, a new way, in a different way. So I don't mind what material I use. It can be zinc, it can be glass, it can be anything else. I also think that architecture has to be enigmatic. There has to be an aspect of secrecy in architecture. It has to be enigmatic. It has to leave you with questions. That's very important in architecture. I was speaking earlier about uh, some of architect, uh, architectural forms that you see in magazines or on internet, and they're absolutely sensational. But if there's not that little bit of ambiguity, uh, that little touch of secrecy, then I think that those architectural designs lose their flavor. Right, we've talked a lot about housing. Let's maybe change the subject a little bit. It's true that uh, you, uh, Spellian Rock, we get the feeling that in your architectural designs, you, there is great unity. You start off with concrete blocks, and then you dress them. <coughs> Uh, that is often very different to, to what uh, uh, Frédéric uh, does as well. There are lots of public spaces and differences. These are differences between uh, housing and the equipment or the material that you, uh, you, that you use. And you, Frédéric, we get the feeling that you always do a little bit the same thing. Uh, Speller went to the architectural school. It's always you've got a type of atrium or lobby, an, an entranceway, uh, like a lobby in a big hotel where people are 
it's not that they're being dealt with as if they were anonymous, because I know that the Rolling Stones uh, come to your hotels, you like photos of Mick Jagger all dressed up in a fur coat, for example. But um, if you have a student in the Paris Val de Seine school or somebody living in social housing, we get the feeling that uh, you are actually highlighting, you're profiling anonymous people thanks to your buildings. The minute you go through the courtyard of the Sempe building in Massena, the minute you go through the lobby of the architectural school, or when the, uh, the gypsies who go to the law courts, uh, they walk through your rather luxurious hotel-style architecture. That's you, Frederic. But you, Spella and Rock, are very different. So I want to know when we've understood what you do for housing, but do you actually ask a different question that you ask yourself if you're doing football stadiums or museums? Is it a different process? Yeah, that's a very interesting question uh, because now we can say that we did variety project from um, let's say clients with uh, all the interest was to to sell the surface okay. so they were not even interest uh, uh, into some let's say they would be a client to wish to work uh, like with Dominic for instance but uh, on the other hand, we have now not just the client, the variety of, uh, let's say, uh, scale projects like stadiums, which can be also today treated as a cathedrals of sport. We can all see what is happening those days in uh, all the France. And maybe now when you ask this question, uh, uh, I'm beginning to ask me why maybe we did what we did here in this kind of installation here, when we wanted to, let's say, go with the on the basics, you know, from, let's say, uh, also we could maybe um, <coughs> be related to all this immigration, all this kind of political situation, but we wanted to go to the basics to have a living minimum spaces, which can be also related to this kind of minimum spaces on the alpine part, so just a space to inhabit, to have a roof, uh, to have a space to, let's say, to survive. And on the other hand, we want to kind of encourage, uh, let's say, the audience, not just us, how they can create some sort of, we could say, this kind of basic living, like they would have to build for themselves. So that's why we created some sort of basic, like our modular, like Corbit Z edit, you know, the modular, the height how, you know, minimum space to sit, to stand, to lie. So maybe that's why I would maybe relate to this question of what we did um, here as an installation is uh, to go with the, on the basics, to create the basic stuff and to have also opportunity to each visitor that he can try to create from our, uh, let's say, uh, limited uh, rules which we started with this diagram. So um, maybe I would relate to your question with this kind of answer which we did on our half part of the um, exhibition space. Spino, qu'est-ce que vous Microphone, please. Can he ask his question with a microphone, please? Pardon, excuse me. Oui. Spila, qu'est-ce qu'un museum? Spila, what is a museum for you? Uh, 
for me, I mean, again, depends. You have many types of museums. Uh, you have, like, we created uh, a museum devoted to historical Ljubljana. So it was about archaeology. It was about uh, creating a contemporary space uh, inside an old palace in the middle of the old city. And then we created also a museum of, of uh, space technologies in Vitanje, which is a totally different approach because it's a new build building and it's about uh, a, a very important person, Hermann Nordung, who devoted his life uh, to research how you can live and survive in the space. So basically, uh, museums can be really, really different uh, types of uh, approaches and buildings and it's, it really depends uh, how you approach. But then, of course, for me the question is how actually today to uh, invite uh, people inside the museums, so museums work, museums live, I mean, what is actually the, the, uh, the sense uh, of creating museums, so it is about creating some kind of space uh, that would become a, a public space also. Frédéric, hello. Frédéric. Do you make a difference between a uh, housing project or another type of project? Or for you, is it always the same problem of inside space, outside space? Are you always trying to uh, embellish the, the, the body of the, of the building? Do you make a distinction between them or not? I think that what's important for us is to keep in mind the utility that the people will make of a building. In the law courts, it's very important to have some type of very solemn, peaceful gardens, but also an idea of a given order of things. And that's why I often choose to put different windows in. Uh, an architect can invent a space, but I think that often those concepts are actually more important than the actual program, as you, say, as you said. My work is what is at the heart of uh, a project. Now, I have another question. Just out of sheer curiosity, I wanted to know for you, which building did, have you preferred to design and why? Are you happier in housing or in other buildings such as museums? You talked about the barn that you designed. What building is the one that you really feel the happiest with, the most comfortable with? and pleased to do? Um, <coughs> dealing with uh, different projects, uh, I would say that I would r a bit rephrase my answer in this case that in the future, I would like, uh, I would not so much distinction between the projects, but I would say that I would distinction between the uh, clients. So in the future, I would, no matter what kind of types of building, no matter what kind of program of the building, I would uh, r really, um, my wish would to have a perfect client to work with. Because your work uh, is spread uh, not only in months or not only the time during the construction um, and in front of the table, you know, when we symbolically say, but this dispersed through years and years. So that time you almost you get in some sort of personal relation with each client. So in this way, I would um, like and maybe I. I would like to wish for all the architects or all the, they would have a clients which they all grow with, you know, not just like uh, professionally, also personally. 
Uh, Ivo Spino. Yeah. For me, uh, let's say my, my favorite building uh, in terms of uh, working, I'm not talking about the final result, was a chapel. Uh, it was a small building. Uh, we almost had no client. Uh, uh, and basically, it was about uh, creating a very special place without not many fa functional restrictions. Uh, beside the hill. So basically it's about retaining walls that create some kind of space that can be whatever you think that space should be. So basically um, that was my favorite building, I think. But also in this case I would just remind you that what was, you know, as an anecdote that, okay, we designed this, but uh, basically we didn't uh, involve the, the s villagers of this, uh, I mean, the, the, the natives of this village, that they have an interior. So then they really, um, they were really happy to announce for us that uh, they went on a shop when they are selling these all products for these chapels and they were so happy they bought a lot of stuff uh, for interior and they even got for free a cross with the Christ of plastic so then when we heard this I, we thought that we will get a, a heart attack so that's also part of the stories personal stories which you are dealing every day with the, the client you know because um, you have this kind of uh, unprecedented stuff, you have this kind of everyday stuff, and you have, I mean, the, the all each project you could tell the, not just a story, but you can write a book on all this kind of happening and the human uh, relations and the, the progress of the project. Frédéric, donc. Frédéric, astonish us. What is the building that you designed, built, or maybe just even imagined? What's your favorite? What's the one that maybe represents you the best? Well, I think that it's not up to me to answer that question. Every single project is an adventure, and uh, they are to be found throughout the entire life of an architect. Things change, the way you design, the way you study them, the way you build them, the different projects uh, progress at different speeds. So it's difficult to say. Our buildings are a bit like our children. There is a, there's an awful lot of affection that goes into our buildings. So there's not one that I prefer to another. Some of them have uh, come to happier endings than others. For some of the buildings we designed but never got to build, but I don't regret that either. That's the life of an architect. There are some projects, uh, well, even sometimes we recycle some projects that we hoped to get to build and then for a specific reason, because of architecture or because of a competition, we, uh, we don't manage to build them. We perhaps try to get them built elsewhere, differently. We recycle certain ideas. The project that I preferred, I can't answer that. I really don't know. Maybe it's the next one, the one I have yet to design. Now, our friends talked about uh, the relations with their clients, uh, with the little chapel that they built, for example. Earlier, you were talking about Lombardini. Did you have real uh, relations with the project managers in yours, your designs? Well, the project manager is uh, extremely important, be it a person or be it uh, an organization. You need an awful lot of energy to deal with clients. You need understanding. You need a certain degree of trust. But that being said, for me, it is not the client who is going to define or truly participate in architecture. Now, that might appear to be the voice of a privileged man speaking, but I do believe that there is a type of filter. There is a frontier between the architect and the client. For me, a client is a person I have to satisfy, entirely satisfy. 
they have a request, they have certain financial constraints, there are perhaps other things, maybe social and political things that I have to satisfy, and I have to satisfy what they want. But above and beyond that, there is everything that goes on backstage, where the architect has to be creative, has to invent in anticipating what he is going to design on a, uh, a blank sheet of paper or on a blank uh, plot of land. Any builder in, uh, who is in a, uh, any builder can, in a big company can actually build with the, with a project manager if they don't want to build anything too complex. But for me, a project manager, if he is in favor of your architecture, of your design, if he likes it, then it's wonderful. But if he doesn't, then I think that uh, nonetheless one has to continue. It was the case with Michel Lombardini. What was wonderful was that he uh, truly trusted the architects to build what he wanted. So for me, the architect designs with certain ingredients that he puts into his design, but he is, he is alone. There is a form of solitude when you're an architect. You work with a team sometimes. You have to respect a certain number of things, but often we work alone. We have to invent our uh, wealth and invent it for people whom we don't know. We don't know the people who are going to live in the buildings. Do you feel that solitude as well that Frédéric was uh, talking about? Or do you have a, a much more uh, type of fusion of a relationship with your client? Um, <clears throat> I would say that we cannot ideal idealize, I mean, to have idealization about the client today. Um, <clears throat> you know, like, it's everything understandable. It's like, uh, you know, pure and, uh, I would say, idealistic and romantic. Uh, but there is uh, certain levels which, you know, you can define, you can, uh, in each project. So um, I would also avoid to um let's say to make a packages or definitions of of let's say what kind of involvement with the client or um, because each that what I really agree is that each project is completely a new let's say uh, you, you can say also born child um, but there's such um you know the things are not black and white you know like all the fairy tales but there it's uh, uh even more than 500,000 of gray uh gray um shape yeah shade so i would say like these books maybe that there it's uh, uh all the essence of project or i would say like a dna um you know, holds inside each cell, so that that's kind of things where the real answers of each, let's say, <coughs> relation client and what it's good for the project, or let's say what can be resulted of a project. Right, we've heard about uh, the project that you've preferred. Can you now tell us a little bit about the most horrible project that you've ever done that you wouldn't even dare show to your mother? Uh, Yes, I mean, actually, I have a project that I don't like, uh, and it was also about the client, actually, a relation with the client or the client that um, maybe was not the right client for us. I, I would agree with Rog that, uh, that um, it's extremely important to find a client, and we try to choose projects, we take projects uh, 
where we actually feel that uh, we can build a certain relation with the client that can bring us somewhere, us and the client, because for us, it's not, I think it's not about that we want to satisfy the client, it's about maybe creating something that we client can learn from or can give something that actually he didn't expect or didn't know that it can exist. Uh, and for us, um, so basically, um, if you don't find a client that gives you that freedom and gives you the trust, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to create something and even it's difficult not to lose the, um, that joy of creating something for, for him or on, on this project, even if you try to not, not think of that uh, part of the, of, the, of the business that of course exists uh, always. Uh, so basically, uh, yes, we dealt, I think twice with the client that we didn't find the real language and that are architectures that at the end I'm not proud of. And which one is it? Can you tell us which project it is that you don't like? Uh, it's one, it's one, um, it's one uh, office building. We did uh, in the neighbor. It's in the kind of periphery of uh, of Ljubljana, and uh, it's one housing, uh, private housing that is still being built. And uh, basically, we didn't write uh, uh, find the right language. And then maybe better is to say goodbye to that building, and it can become <laughs> whatever client wants it to become, and not to have any relation. That's it. And what about you, Frédéric? Well, I do have a worst project, actually. Um, no, I don't have one. I have several. It's going to depend on certain outside circumstances when you have clients or when you have certain conditions that uh, make it very difficult to, uh, to, to, to master there are some things that are very difficult to live through with clients. Um, there's even forms of betrayal sometimes. And that is true in the architectural world as well. However, there, there are some of my designs that are perhaps more serene than others were. The project that I worked on in Nantes with a colleague was a, a good example of that. I have no difficulty in walking in front of the buildings that I have designed. I try to bring them up to scratch. Uh, sometimes I didn't take uh, aesthetic risks that I would have liked to have taken. But I think that uh, I think that even the times when I have taken aesthetic risks. I have uh, maybe built buildings that some people find ugly, disturbing. But I accept that because I know precisely why each of those buildings was designed the way it was, why uh, it, the, its raison d'etre. Perhaps other people don't understand the building, but for me, every building, every shape in my work is there for a reason. It's not something that uh, was just a, uh, an easy way out. Although sometimes what is easy is necessary as well. It's true that uh, my designs are often complex. Uh, complexity is dangerous. And even in the architectural world, complexity is dangerous. I'm not the only one uh, in France. There are a lot of very well-known architects who take a lot of risks as well, and thank goodness. But I think that that risk is part of why we exist. We always have to continue to invent shapes, to make them talk. I like to get my shapes to talk, be they made out of paper, cardboard, plaster. And it's true that sometimes we make mistakes. So is there one that is worse than another in my portfolio? I don't think I can say that. Some are perhaps less interesting than others. 
but uh, I consider them all on an equal footing because I worked on them all in exactly the same way, with the same intensity. Maybe the obstacles were different, uh, maybe the, uh, uh, the delivery date or the, uh, uh, the finances or the client, but that's one of the things the architect has to do is to try to overcome all of those uh, problems. And the final building is not going to have stamped across uh, the, 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 the penthouse apartment the problems of price, the problems of client, the problems of uh, the uh, context. It should never bear the scars of the problems that you encountered. Well, thank you very much. Before giving the floor to a Q&A session, I would like to ask you a somewhat uh, bizarre question. Have you seen the office building in Pantin? Yes, says Frédéric. And you, have you seen the architectural building here in Paris? Could you perhaps criticize the, the other building, the other architect's buildings? What do you like, for example, in the Paris Val de Seine school? And what do you not like? in that architecture. And you, Frédéric, can you tell us a little bit about the student housing? What do you like about it in Pontin? And what do you not like about it? Who wants to start? Spiller? Because I was teaching in that school, you didn't visit the school, right? Yeah. Uh, I didn't, but I can just uh, excuse myself because um, I have a really bad habit, especially when I'm in foreign city or I'm traveling, that uh, I really hate to see architecture. <laughs> I don't know, maybe this is like a professional, <laughs> but I know I like to sit at the coffee space, you know, uh, observing the people, observing the life, but I don't want to see architecture, uh, especially because time is get you are every time uh, under some sort of pressure of time and you have to go somewhere with a uh, uh, I mean certain um, interest or certain job that you have to go and the only spare time I would not like to spend to see ar architecture but uh, you know like I told you to sit there so I admit that that's my bad habit so I cannot uh, relate to also to my colleagues uh, building. Uh, well I, I was in the school for uh, 10 days I think uh, every day and uh, I always enjoyed walking inside the school through that kind of empty space in front that basically uh, has no kind of function, let's say, <laughs> but it's a very important space uh, that in a way determines uh, for, for myself at least uh, the school and makes a kind of filter uh, of the busy street, of the noisy, kind of smelly, ugly kind of uh, area around around the the river in that part of the of the city, uh, and the school that in a way it's a kind of um, uh, sanctuary. Uh, so basically, to walk through that empty space uh, was for me always like a filter <laughs> cleaning up before entering into a, a different uh, world of uh, education. Uh, what I enjoyed also is uh, what m maybe you, you mentioned today, this kind of uh, uh, lobby that is generous, that in a way maybe we wouldn't do because maybe we are already so determined ourselves uh, in creating uh, functional and efficient spaces in terms of creating uh, not many square meters, that in a way those kind of spaces that uh, create uh, social interactions and uh, create kind of relations between students, teachers and so on um, can, can uh, happen like this. I think it's a very good, uh, good uh, point. So for me, the most quality space of the school was this kind of uh, outside external entrance and uh, the inside lobby that in a way merged into the classrooms. What I, in a way, uh, 
missed in the school was a kind of communication between the classrooms. Uh, often uh, I found myself kind of lost in the, in the corridors, like uh, the space in a way it's uh, quite labyrinthic. Uh, of course you cannot do everything, but for example if I compare the building at Harvard, the GSD, I don't know if, if many, uh, some of you know the building where the studios, for example, they are uh, created in the, in the terraces, in the space, so basically students can view kind of enjoy or even compute, uh, co compete with their, um, with their, with other students. Uh, there is a certain relation that happens even if you don't want it to happen inside those schools that in a way in this school I missed. That basically classrooms are quite uh, isolated. Of course it has good point also because you can concentrate on your work, but I miss that kind of uh, trying to see what other guys are doing because I feel that especially in architectural schools it's important you are bothered all the time that maybe someone else is doing something better and that you have to be better. <laughs> so basically that's, uh, that's what I missed for example. Merci beaucoup pour la critique. Hein. Thank you very much for that criticism. Frédéric? Criticize, and you can be very nasty now that you've heard that. No, not at all. Now, about the school, that school for me is an area where Classrooms exist. It's, uh, there are types of uh, corridors on every stage. Some of the classrooms uh, have uh, uh, windows. To start with, we wanted it to be to resemble a town in which there would be four schools. So it was a, a teaching challenge to say that you're going to have four schools in the same place. Those streets, the longitudinal spaces were created as if they were roads and squares which would uh, allow the teachers and the students between uh, lessons to actually do presentations or to sit in those big spaces. I think that uh, you're right that there are certain uh, spaces to welcome people that are missing, but uh, Francis Ambert, I believe, is going to change that and is going to put something near the, uh, uh, the lobby so that uh, it's more welcoming for people who, who arrive. People have been working on that. There are improvements that have been suggested. In a building like that, there are about 2,000 people who go through that on a day-to-day -day basis. 2,000 students, 300 teachers, the administrative staff. It's a building that is only just reaching its cruising speed. Uh, it is one that is uh, changing every five years, for example. We, it's a bit like a toolbox, that building, and you can use it for different things, depending on the time of the day and depending on the subject that is to be taught. So it is a building that is quite capable, I hope, of uh, being able to be changed and modified in the future, usefully, of course. Now, for your project, your student housing, I found it unbelievably fresh in the Paris uh, landscape. What I liked with your uh, building is that it is very generous. As you said, you had a certain square meterage, but I think that you did more than just uh, meeting specifications. I think this is why your work is of such an amazing quality from what I have seen from it. You went further than just the square meterage. You have given things that were not expected. You offer certain things that nobody was expected, and it's a true gift. And the gift that you have given in that housing uh, building is in the, um, the, the lobbies, uh, the areas where people can sit and talk, in the, um, your corridors, your outside corridors as well. I think that they are very impressive. And your building also looks as if it's staged in its environment. I also admire the way you have taken certain shapes and you've played with them like they were little plastic cubes or little Tetris cubes. Uh, some of these shapes, you've just tipped them over slightly and it's given us a, a sculptural emotion. 
uh, and you managed to do that in a project in which there were an awful lot of constraints. So I think that we are similar there because we know how to work with shapes uh, to to free those shapes. Your building is a very singular one if you look at it in the Paris landscape. It's singular because of its shape. It's singular because of the material that you chose. Uh, it is singular, full stop. If I were to criticize anything, I would say that maybe I wouldn't have chosen the same material and the same colors for each block. I think that uh, uh, colors could have changed or something, but it's a, a wonderful addition to the French landscape, to the Parisian landscape. Anything that you want to end? Uh, do you want to reply to Frédéric's uh, presentation or his criticism of what you did in Pantin? I would maybe do a more or less as a closure <laughs> now um, that I'm really happy that we collaborate somehow and what also exhibition shows that some things can be some sort of to each other uh, um, a contrast but they still correlate between each other uh, especially like uh, when I was um, watching the video really I admire this church did I don't know if this is still a project or it's uh, work on site or it's uh, going on site or so uh, I'm really happy also for this kind of occasion that we can share the view it's not just about uh, presentation on my architect but it's kind of uh, let's say try to correlate and to have some sort of interaction which also we try to do uh, one step forward to interact with the audience so basically what uh, just what it states is I would like to thank you to organize right to you for really exhausting uh, and expiring uh, conversation and <clears throat> What I would like to see if, if we can also, this could not be the end of the, uh, let's say, um, just this and it would lead to something else, co coincidentally or incoincidentally. So let's see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I would just like to add also thank you to, to, the, to the team of uh, Cité d'Architecture. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, moment for us. Actually, we didn't collaborate with some kind of architect <laughs> that we didn't know before. Uh, so it's a nice surprise uh, for us also this evening. And the installation, uh, thank you to, uh, to, to Bruno and Daphne, our, let's say, local uh, French uh, office, to all the support and help you are giving us, and to Andre, our uh, architect who worked with us on the installation uh, and of course to the audience that uh, didn't fall asleep <laughs> through all this long conversation. Thank you. I'd like to thank the City of Architecture as well. I'd like to thank everybody for having uh, enabled us to come here tonight to talk about our architecture. There are very few opportunities to do that for us, so thank you very much. Right, any last questions before you applaud? <laughs>